Coming up, we're taking a look back at Indian country's most impactful native athletes. I'm Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from Indian country today. Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that, sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. is Indian Country Today. Amirawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. I'm Aliyah Chavez. On this day, we bring you a special program about impactful indigenous athletes. Some of those are Olympians who still hold records, cross-country runners, MMA fighters, and football teams that changed the game. Let's take a look at a 17-year-old runner in Nevada who decided to reenact his great-grandfather, Quint Frank Quinn's escape when he went to boarding school back in 1913. Caitlin Onawa Boisel has the story. I'm gonna put on my socks before I go over there. Koo Stevens is 17 years old and the descendant of a boarding school survivor. His family organized a two day run to remember those who did or didn't make it home. I've never been one for retying shoes over and over. So to anybody else, you just come here and you see these old buildings. You know, you see the cool rocks on the walls and the, the old window panes. You know, you can tell it's an old place. But to me, it's, um, you know what happened here. And it's a lot different to just anybody else coming here and visiting. You know, it's a lot more personal. At just eight years old, Ku's great-grandfather broke out of the Stewart Indian School to escape the cruel and harsh conditions. Now Ku is retracing his great-grandfather's escape. Because as an eight-year-old to cross 50 miles over these hills, that's, that's, a, that's a feat. <laughs> we know from our archives that students typically were not in the best health because they weren't fed well. We know that clothing was often an issue. They were um, given a uniform and typically hand-me-down shoes that were left over from U.S. soldiers. So... Definitely not the clothing and nor any kind of equipment that you would think anyone, a healthy adult would need, much less an eight-year-old. But again, we have firsthand accounts of these types of very heroic, just absolutely courageous attempts by these young people to get back to their families. But Ku's great-grandfather wasn't the only one who attempted to run away. To federal representatives, people that were paid by Uncle Sam to round up students to take them to very far away institutions for boarding school. Also, bounties were put out for young Indian children. Right, Often the federal government Whoa. would pay people to find runaways. The scene was happening at dozens of other government run boarding schools for native children. Ku's journey started at the Stewart Indian School and ended at the Yerington Paiute tribe. Ku is a cross country runner at his high school. His great grandfather was just eight when he ran the same path to get home. That journey took them both uphill. Ku ran during the day. His family says it's more likely his great grandfather, Frank, ran at night to avoid being seen. Ku ended his journey with a celebration from friends and family. He says he even felt his ancestors on his feet. I didn't really, uh, I didn't, it didn't really hit me until the end about what I was doing. <laughs> Running down that hill and, you know, seeing my valley and seeing my home and just my people's land out here. Oh man, goosebumps all the way down. And he knows what he would say to his great grandfather if he was here today. <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for getting me this far because, you know, without him and 
the decisions he would have made, you know, to even run away from here. If he didn't, I possibly I couldn't even be here. Thanks for being thanks for being a good man and wanting to be with your family and wanting to support them in any way that you could. Cuz that's uh that's family, you know. You do anything for them. We both did it. <laughs> in Nevada. Ah, yeah, thanks for coming again. Caitlin Anawa boy sell. Indian to country yourself. today. Billy Mills remains the only American to win the Olympic gold medal in the 10,000 meter race. We'll hear ICT anchor Mark Trahant interviewing Billy Mills on what it means to hold this title for nearly 60 years. Billy Mills joins us today to talk about that historic moment and the race that was held Friday night in Tokyo. Welcome, Billy. Yes, great to be with you. Well, let's start. You got up very early to watch the 10,000 meter race this year. Tell us about that. Well, it was exciting watching the race today. Uh, one of the Kenyans, excuse me, the, one of the Ugandans uh, last year came very close to breaking two minute, two hours in the marathon. And when the race started, the Ugandan took the lead immediately. But what came to mind was he's going to push, try to draw out a couple of the other top distance runners, uh, Ethiopia, Kenyan, for example, and have them come after him to help empower the, the other two Ugandans. And at some point in the race, he'll either decide to stay in or drop out. So that, that was pretty accurate there, but uh, in the humidity, uh, it was very difficult running, but I was thrilled with uh, our, our young runner, uh, Fisher, who got fifth. Uh, I actually thought he had a chance to pick up a medal, and uh, I thought he ran a, just a very intelligent race. Not, you're not really hitting a wall. Uh, you're in there struggling with the different strategies. And if there was a wall to be hit, for me, it was coming off the curve with 110 meters to go when I was going low blood sugar and feeling that tingling sensation of, of low blood sugar, the sticky sweat, not the fluid flowing sweat of exercise. So I was going low blood sugar coming off the curve. And what saved me, Patricia was 14 rows up, three seats in from the aisle, 95 meters from the finish line. And at that point, I saw another runner with an eagle on his singlet. And it reminded me of my dad when my mom died and my dad saying, son, you have broken wings. And it takes, a, it takes a dream to heal broken wings. Later, just facing the racism of America, I, I broke and then was so close to suicide and a junior in college. And I remember my dad saying, it takes a dream to heal broken wings. I wrote down the dream, gold medal Olympic 10,000 meter run, not to become a gold medalist, but to heal a broken soul. And that was my race. It was 100 meters to go. Just one more try, one more try then I may be this close, I may never be this close again. I've got to do it now, but I'm gonna win, but I may not get to the finish line first. So was I contradicting myself? Then lifting my knees, lengthening my stride, pumping my arms, feeling the tape breaking across my chest, an official, an official coming up to me and simply saying, who are you, who are you? And I go, oh my God, did I, did I miscount the laps? And he says, new Olympic champion. Is there anything we can do for you? And I said, I need my wife. I told him where Patricia was sitting. Within moments, they're tapping her on the shoulder. Mrs. Mills, the new Olympic champion, wants his wife. <laughs> Patricia came down and we hugged her. She told me what they said and it was just emotional. I found the runner that had the eagle on his singlet. There was no eagle. It was simply a perception. And then it was like, I'm gonna win, met. I was gonna heal a broken soul. And in the process, I just may become an Olympic gold medalist. So uh, I don't know how many Olympians have experienced maybe similar circumstances, but mine was extremely sacred, just extremely emotional. And my training was based on the virtues and the values of the Lakota culture, taking the virtues and values from culture, tradition, spirituality, and trying to live those daily as I pursued healing a broken soul. You've been a part of the Olympic movement 
for, ever since then. How does that send a story? How is that as a narrative for young Native people? And how should they look at the Olympic movement in a broader sense? You know, that, that story that I think would be for youth uh, is the Japanese youth born on the day of the atomic bombs being dropped to the day of the opening ceremonies, 1964. They, the leadership wanted the young youth, the youth of Japan, the youth of the world to see the world as one. Now our Lakota prayer, we are all related, helped me see the world as, as one. And that's where I took global unity through the dignity, character, beauty of global diversity, the, the future of humankind. One final connection there. Some of the elders on the reservation at the time, uh, Oliver Redcloud, <clears throat> I, I, get, I get a little emotion here. Oliver Redcloud took the pipe and he prayed to the four directions. Not that I would win, but that I could represent myself. I could humble myself, rent myself with our virtues and values. So I could honor my family, my tribal nation, and the United States of America. Then he reminded me of the Black Hills, the heart of everything that is. So as I fly into Tokyo, Japan, before the race, and I look out the window, and I saw Mount Fuji, and just on a spiritual way, it was, this must be the heart of everything that is to the Japanese. And I was trying to climb Mount Olympus. Why? For many reasons, but because one of the greatest athletes of all time, who to me is an Olympic god, and that's where he dwells, atop Mount Everest, and that's uh, not atop Mount Olympus, and that's Jim Thorpe. Uh, I think Jim Thorpe was not a hero of mine. He was more of a god, and I just felt the opportunity to maybe in some way rub shoulders with Jim Thorpe through, through my Olympic experience. So I would say we're all related. I would say see the world as one, global unity through the dignity, character, beauty of global diversity. And our youth will play a major role in choreographing the horizon of Amer America's future, choreographing how we fit in to this great democratic experiment. Uh, just one last question, Billy. This Olympic season has a number of indigenous athletes and another gold medal winner in surfing. Uh, does that bring a great deal of pride to you? Oh, absolutely. There's, there's just an inherent connection. Uh, I followed many other countries had a number of indigenous people on their Olymp Olympic teams. So when I watched her make that break and come on and off that wave, it was, it was so empowering. And then watching the, uh, the male indigenous person uh, give, give thanks to, uh, to the water, to the ocean, to the waves. Uh, they gave him a challenge, but one he could not overcome. So I, I identify so powerfully. And if, if I could uh, say one other thing to the youth, I think we need to learn more about our virtues and values. We need to learn how they fit into the world today. For example, I took as a young boy, combined the virtue of honesty and truth, and they're combined. And I would love our youth, particularly indigenous youth, to understand the difference, their virtues and values, but America, our leadership misuses them. So for example, honesty, you hear that constantly among our leaders, elected officials. Honesty is expressing your feelings and your opinions accurately, even though your feelings and your opinions may not accurately represent the truth. Some of our leaders, elected officials of the US government use honesty honestly speaking their feelings and their opinions to deceive, to misdirect. Now let's take the Lakota concept of truth. Truth is an accurate representation of 
whatever you honestly expressed. So I encourage constantly when I have opportunities to commute with the to commute with our youth to learn the difference between honesty and truth and speak the truth as we choreograph and they help choreograph our future in this great democratic experiment. When we come back, we're talking football and the history that goes along with it. A lot of people spend Sunday watching pro football. It's a chance to root for a favorite team. But there's a history that's worth remembering about how indigenous people contributed to the sport's creation. Kate, Caitlin Onawa Boysell looks back on this American sport. At the turn of the 20th century, the leading football team came from the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It was the first boarding school run by the U.S. government. Assimilating into a white Christian culture was the goal, and young Native children were forced to leave their families to attend this boarding school. They were forbidden to speak their languages or practice their religions. When they arrived at Carlisle, their heads were shaved, their clothes were burned in front of them, and they were put in front of a blackboard with names written in chalk on the blackboards. And they couldn't read the names, but they were instructed to point to a name, and then that was their name. The conditions were crude. They were fed a poor diet, and the dorms were overcrowded, making it easy for disease to spread quickly, killing young children. Thorpe came to Carlisle when he was 16 years old. Still, it was at this school and under these horrific conditions that a powerhouse football team was born. And by 1907, they were considered one of the most dynamic football teams. The players came from several different tribes. Frank Mount Pleasant is recognized with inventing the spiral pass. He was from the Tuscarora Nation. The team also pioneered the overhand spiral and other trick plays that frustrated their opponents, as documented by the school and in media reports. Elmer Bush was from the Pomo tribe and he was inducted into the American Indian Hall of Fame in 1973. They both played with Thorpe at Carlisle. Jim Thorpe is considered one of the greatest athletes of all time. He inspired future indigenous football players like my grandfather, Glenn Condren. Jim Thorpe was a, a Native American, was a superhero. I mean, and he was a super athlete. And he played, I guess, every sport there was, and he did well at every one of them. So. Thorpe was an outstanding runner. He earned a spot on the U.S. track team and went to the 1912 Olympics. There, he easily won both the pentathlon and decathlon. Later, he was accused of playing for money because he joined the New York Giants baseball club. His gold medals were taken away by the Olympic Committee and later returned. Today, he is listed as a co-champion. But some say that isn't enough. It means so much to Indian country to restore these honors. So. Uh, the letter was sent to the president of the IOC saying, we'd like to work this out, work with you. We've started the petition. You know, uh, we are very interested in getting this done. And um, we actually never heard back from him. Um, he had one of his librarians send us a letter and um, which had some actual factual information that was incorrect. So still to this day, his family fights for his recognition in the Olympics. After high school, Thorpe joined the first indigenous national football team called the Oorang Indians. The team was based in LaRue, Ohio. Walter Lingo started the team in 1922, and at that time, the NFL franchise fee was just $100 a year. The team wasn't the best. They only won three games in two years of playing. Lingo focused a lot of his team's efforts on halftime shows to entertain the crowd and advertise for his business. He owned a dog kennel and trained the dogs to perform tricks with the players. Still, Thorpe was a part of many firsts in football, including becoming the first president of the American Professional Football Association, known today as the NFL. 
None of this history is taught in America's public schools, not the history of government running boarding schools, and not the history of how the football players influence the game. And you kind of see the erasure of American history and Native Americans, not just in football. You can't say we should try to see it in all of American history. Um, so I'm glad, you know, we're, we're kind of retelling this. Because of his influence on the game, Thorpe was inducted into the Professional Football Hall of Fame, inspiring other NFL players like Jim Warren. Warren had an outstanding college career at Arizona State University. In 1987, he was on the team that won the Rose Bowl. He went on to play for the Cincinnati Bengals and the Detroit Lions and Tampa Bay, inspired by the legacy of Jim Thorpe. It was still influential to me to see a Native person as the greatest athlete in the world. After Warren retired from the NFL, he went into the film industry and used his voice to raise the issue of misrepresentation of Natives in football. A film he produced about the use of Native mascots premiered on the Fox network on Thanksgiving in 2020. I never did play for a team with a native mascot, but I played against teams with native mascots. So obviously I was a target of people that wanted to say things like scalp the Indian or cut your hair. When you and then of course, when George Preston Marshall took over the football team in Washington, dropping the name on there that became so offensive that we recently saw changed because of economic pressure, uh, not so much because of a battle of conscience, um, it's really opened up some eyes to help people try to rediscover um, the Native American impact on football, on this country. Other notable players include Sam Bradford, who is from the Cherokee Nation and a Heisman Trophy winner. Also wide receiver that plays for the LA Chargers, Keenan Allen, who is Lumbee. And starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, Dak Prescott, who is Choctaw and Apache. And more than 60 Pacific Islanders have been a part of the NFL, according to the Pacific Islanders Football Hall of Fame. And they all have this one thing in common. You're only as good as your last play. I mean, and you you never know when the la your last play is either. Behind the scenes, there's one man who's looking to groom the next generation of indigenous professional players. For 13 years, Robert Judkins has led the live production of NFL games. His job is to make sure viewers can watch their favorite team with no interruptions. He saw a need for training and held his first football camp in Southern California on the land of the Saboba Band of Luceno Indians. 100 kids turned out as well as some professional football players. Um, there are a lot of Native kids, especially in the high school ranks, that don't get exposure. Um, some great talent that's out there. I mean, definitely D1 uh, prospects that are out there. And so I think there's a need for uh, exposure and to get kids at a younger age exposed to the game of football and just exposed to sports in general. From future D1 prospects to being considered one of the greatest athletes of all time, indigenous people have led the effort in football. But will there ever be another Jim Thorpe? I'm trying to think of athletes who try to do more than one sport. And I just don't think our society is structured in that capacity. I think if someone shows a great deal of skill, it's not to say it can't happen, but I think it's very unlikely. It's been more than 109 years since Jim Thorpe and his teammates came up with trick plays that you still see today. So the next time you watch football, think about the Carlisle Indians and Jim Thorpe and how they shaped the game. Kaylin Anwa Boisel, Indian Country Today. Professional fighter Shannon Rich from the Choctaw Nation won his retirement headlining fight with Darren Martinez from Gila River. He took home the indigenous belt during the pay-per-view event. Take a look. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It was a rowdy Saturday night for indigenous MMA fighters who entered the cage at Celebrity Theater in Phoenix with one winning his retirement fight. 
Shannon Rich stepped into the cage for his last time and won his pro headliner matchup against Samson Wededdle via submission in the first round with a rear naked choke. As soon as he kind of turned, what were you thinking? I was like, I got him. I'm 51 years old, making my last fight in front of my hometown and for a native promotion. This is a dream come true. Rich had his first fight in 1991 when it was still called No Holds Barred. He was the first Native American world champion MMA fighter. I fought in uh, New Mexico and it was for a native promotion and they had the first Native American uh, championships for, for mixed martial arts. And I won and I, I went through the tournament and won three fights in a row in one night and I, I got the belt. Now that he's tapping out after 237 professional fights, the most out of any MMA fighter, he'll be exploring acting full time. He has a movie coming out with Mickey Rourke and Michael J. White in January called The Commando, and another coming out with Bruce Willis. On Saturday, Darren Martinez from Gila River won his amateur title 265 pound matchup against George Soapy, who's Samoa from Oahu. I, I've talked about this, you know, coming and fighting, you know, under a, a big card and um, just pursuing it. In Phoenix, Karina Dominguez reporting for ICT. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. I'm Leah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.